It seems that no matter how much there is to learn about repairing, mixing, or mastering your music, low-end frequencies and how to control them remains a pivotal challenge for emerging producers. So let's demystify some of the science behind how low-end is perceived in our ears and in a studio environment and give you strategies towards achieving a defined and balanced low-end in your productions. Now, speaking of perception, what if I told you that the entire time I've been speaking, we've been running a 50 hertz sine wave underneath this video? Surprised? You shouldn't be. Low end is hard to hear unless you have the right equipment and to some extent, the right mindset. Many of our audio devices like laptop or smartphone speakers may not accurately reproduce low end information like the tone that you just heard. Even some headphones may struggle to accurately represent low end in a way that our ears can perceive. So now would be a really good time to throw on some good quality headphones or fire up your loudspeakers because more examples like the one I just mentioned are coming. And listen, if there's one takeaway from this video, it's that your ears, your room, even your gear can prevent you from successfully perceiving low end. But if you're armed with the right knowledge and tools, you'll begin to overcome these low end challenges. So let's define the first hurdle towards controlling the low end. Your ears. Now first, what am I talking about when I say low end? Think about the controls on your car's speaker system. That bass control adjusts the low frequencies, the lows, and the treble adjusts the high frequencies, the highs. Some even have control over the frequencies between the lows and the highs, aptly called middle frequencies or mids. So when I say the low end in the context of audio work, I'm actually only referring to the frequency range spanning between 0 and 250 hertz. Anything above this would be typically considered low mid-range, and above that, upper mid-range, and on and on all the way to the highs. You can see low end encompasses frequencies that are more felt than heard, where the more fundamental or tonal frequencies of most instruments can be found. It's this zero to 250 hertz that's so difficult for producers to hear and ultimately control. Now you may have noticed earlier that this 50 hertz sine wave was still a little hard to hear even after I revealed it to you, much harder to hear than my voice. The human ear doesn't actually perceive low end elements like sustained bass or 808s to be as loud as mid or high instruments like my voice which as you can see, spans a wide frequency range on the musical frequency chart. Okay, so let's see this in practice. Let's play that 50 Hertz tone again. Try to internalize how loud it feels. Now I'll play an upper mid range tone at 2.5 kilohertz. Which one sounded louder to you? Well, Technically, they're both playing at the same loudness of 10 decibels each, but that 2.5 kilohertz, that sounded way louder than the 50 hertz tone, didn't it? So what's going on here? The human range of hearing spans from around 20 to 20,000 hertz. And through a number of interesting experiments over the years, us humans have discovered that our ears are especially sensitive to sounds residing in that upper frequency range and much less sensitive in the lower range. Even though both sine waves were played at the same loudness, one sounds louder than the other, and always will, as shown by the fletcher munson equal loudness curve. So this is the first thing we need to remember and internalize. Our ears are biased toward higher frequencies than lower frequencies, even if the sound source is the same scientifically measurable loudness. This is why audio engineers use a different loudness standard than decibels, dB, when they're mixing and mastering music. It's called LUFS, and it takes into account this skewed perception of frequency. In fact, we're especially sensitive to 3.5 kilohertz, and some say this is likely due to the resonant frequency of our ear canal. 
Using Isotope Insight, you'll notice that the 50 Hz tone and the 2.5 kHz tone have different LUFS readings because LUFS takes into account that human perception of the loudness. The 50 Hz tone, according to the LUFS reading, is quieter than the 2.5 kHz one. So what does this mean for you, the producer? Well, I can tell you it doesn't mean that you should turn low frequency content up in your mix so that it's as loud or at the same LUFS level as stuff in the upper mid range like my voice or a snare drum. Don't do this. In fact, the tendency to crank low frequency content will just flood your mix and lead to a low end swampy mess, which might be why you're watching this video in the first place. Now, I'm not saying never turn your low end up. In fact, it's certainly true that low end has risen in loudness and prominence across the history of recorded music, from the tinfoil phonograph to today's digital streaming file formats. These technological advances have led to more room, essentially, for low end. It used to be that if you had too much low end in the LP, the stylus would just jump right out of the groove. But in the days of digital streaming, much more low end can be present in a recording without breaking the technology, so to speak. But with the rising level of low end in commercial mixes, you need to figure out how to properly manage it if your mixes are going to compete with professionally produced material. Okay, so that was a lot. Let's summarize. Humans are less sensitive to low frequencies and more so to high and mid frequencies as shown by the Fletcher Munson Equal Loudness Curve. Audio engineers use LUFS as a loudness standard, and you should too, to account for our sensitivity to mid frequencies. The rising level of low end in recorded music means that producers like you have to learn how to properly manage this mix element in order to compete with professionally produced material. So now that we talked about what low end is, what I mean when I say it and how our ears perceive it, let's pivot to how it behaves when you're producing music in an acoustic environment like your bedroom or project studio. Your monitors. In audio production, we refer to the speakers as monitors. Now, when shopping for studio monitors, it's important to invest in a pair that reveal as much mix detail at an even frequency response across the 20 to 20K audible frequency range as is possible. Treating your room, I'll talk about what that means in a moment, is important to get the most out of those monitors. For the best low end reproduction, you'll want to use a loudspeaker that represents low frequencies accurately. So ideally, you're investing in a two or three way near field stereo speaker design. Let's take a second to talk about near field mains and other popular monitors. Those giant speakers that you see in studios that are sometimes flush with the wall are known as studio mains. Now they're extremely expensive and many engineers rely on them only for precise EQ tweaks. And this is because the smaller near field monitors that we're going to focus on in this video are closer to a true average Joe consumer listening experience. So this means that something like those cubes or the NS10s aren't going to spit out low end well enough to make critical mixing decisions. Now, some engineers look to things like special cone vibrations in the NS10s for clues about low end health, but actually hearing the low end is really important. Now, you might be wondering, do I need a subwoofer, which covers around the 20 to 150 Hertz audible range? I mean, I, I say audible, but really that stuff down there is more felt than heard, as you'll remember from our previous chapter. A sub isn't always necessary, but if you want one, make sure to get one that's made by the same manufacturer as your larger stereo monitors and do some research on how to calibrate and place the subwoofer in your space. Having it below the desk on the floor in between the left and right monitors isn't always the best location. So experimenting with its placement is crucial. A quick word about enclosures. You'll often see monitors with a hole at the bottom. That hole, sometimes called a port or a vent, is essentially a resonator for low end. Holes like this make the bass really come alive and sound boomy and powerful. Now, this resonator might be ideal for impressing clients in your studio or impressing you, the producer, on the showroom floor, but honestly, I'd encourage you to experiment with plugging that hole with some foam or another material to see what sounds better to you specifically in the low end. 
In fact, my loudspeaker comes with plugs that fit snugly into the port. Closing the port can often deliver a tighter bass sound, which in my personal experience is better for my mixing and mastering work here at home. So something to think about. At the end of the day, when shopping for your monitors, it's really important to listen to as many as you can and ideally test them in your space. Because when manufacturers develop their monitors, they don't test them in DJ Dave's basement studio. They actually use anechoic chambers. So it's really important to keep in mind the role your own space plays when considering loudspeakers, especially for low end. Let's recap. Look for monitors with an even frequency response across the audible frequency range. For accurate low end representation, try going for a two or three way near field stereo speaker design. Those Oratone Cubes or Yamaha NS10s aren't really suitable for hearing low end. Subwoofers are not necessary, but if you buy them, make sure to get the same brand as the larger stereo monitors and experiment with its placement. Also experiment with plugging the ports or the vents on your monitors for a tighter, more polite bass. And lastly, just test your monitors in your own space if you can, because manufacturers test theirs in anechoic chambers, not bedroom studios. Now speaking about low end and how it behaves in your average studio, let's move on to the next section. For everything we've said about loudspeakers, they're honestly useless without some form of room treatment. And low end frequencies can be especially troublesome to control. When low end frequency content leaves your monitors, it travels in all directions like ripples in a pond. And when this low end reaches a surface like a window or a wall, it creates a new sound source at that point of contact, almost as if you placed another speaker there altogether. This creates what's called a standing wave, which is a sound wave pattern created when sound bounces back and forth between two surfaces in a confined space, such as between two walls. You've essentially confined it such that it's bouncing back and forth, looping almost endlessly until you turn the monitors off. These waves can interfere with each other and combine, causing certain frequencies to be either amplified or attenuated at different points in the studio, resulting in resonant frequencies called room modes. And these room modes don't just happen horizontally, right? They can actually happen from all angles of the room. Now, to make these matters worse, according to the laws of acoustics, when a particular frequency is caught in that resonant loop, all of its related frequencies, known as harmonics, are also confined. For instance, if the lowest resonant frequency is 50 Hz, then its harmonics, including 100, 150, 200, 250, and so on, will also be confined. The bad news? The deepest resonant frequencies happen to be the most impactful ones. When it comes to small rooms, these lower frequencies fall within the range of our hearing, meaning you're going to hear these modes and you could be fooled into making really bad decisions because you can't tell that the room is affecting the mix. So what can we do? Keep your speakers as far away from the walls or any boundaries as possible. The closer they are, the more low end builds up. You should consider investing in absorption and diffusion. This is back when I was talking about treatment. The purpose of diffusers is to disperse sound energy, even low frequency energy in standing waves. On the other hand, absorbers work by absorbing sound energy, thus avoiding the creation of those trap loops that we discussed earlier. Absorbers are especially helpful for really small rooms like the one that I'm in. And the reason is simple. If we absorb sound as it hits the wall, we damp the reflected energy and therefore minimize the effect of standing waves. Now, to prevent vibrations from affecting those monitors, products like isolation pads, and these are sometimes made from foam or spikes, are commonly used to separate monitors from the surface that they're mounted on. This is known as decoupling. And this is going to ensure that the speaker can work independently without any back vibrations from its stand interfering with its day-to-day -day operation. This decoupler is often said to deliver a more focused bass response. So even after all that, and maybe even a dash of corrective room software, which can be great, perceiving low end can still be a challenge. You might be tempted to reach for a pair of headphones and avoid your room altogether. So let's talk a little bit about headphones and low end perception. 
With headphones, you get to kick the room modes, standing modes, and even flutter echoes, more on those in another video, to the curb. When you pair great headphones with a great headphone amp, the low end from around 80 to 400, 500 hertz can be solidly reproduced. Other issues like comb filtering from early reflections or worrying about sitting in the perfect spot in the equilateral triangle, those are moot. Even the directivity of the tweeters not hitting your ears perfectly based on your posture or lack thereof totally disappears with headphones. I say embrace them, especially for referencing low end in a room with flawed acoustics. What's more, you and everyone you know uses headphones to listen to music these days. So it's good to hear what they're hearing and tune your mix accordingly. So let's sum up. Loudspeakers, useless without some form of room treatment. Low end can be difficult to control because it spreads in all directions, creating new sounds or standing waves when they reach different surfaces. Standing waves interfere with each other and cause certain frequencies to be amplified or attenuated. These are known as room modes. To prevent room modes, keep speakers away from boundaries and invest in absorption and diffusion. Isolation pads can prevent vibrations from affecting the monitors. Headphones can be a really useful tool for referencing low end in a room with flawed acoustics. Now that we've gone over the acoustic and psychoacoustic background of low end and how to manage it in the physical world, how the heck do we manage it in the digital realm? Now, most would agree that you should mix with your ears and not your eyes, but we can't compete with the hearing range of bats. And as I mentioned, and has become the theme of this video, our room, our ears, even our gear can work against us. Because of this, meters become a useful tool for confirming or denying what we think we hear vibrating through the air, especially those low end vibrations. In the last 10 years, metering has really evolved from level and or phase to displaying energy, width, tonality, and more. Let's get some music playing through a variety of meters and settle on the one that best represents low end in the most helpful way. You might be familiar with phase meters that measure the phase coherence between the left and right channels of the mix. Now this meter is good for determining if my mix element is in or out of phase, which has some low end implications, but what it doesn't tell me is if my low end is too boomy or too flat or totally chaotic. Another meter known as the level meter measures average or peak loudness. They can sometimes look like this or this, which is a VU meter. Now these meters, while useful on individual tracks and mixes, tell us very little about what's going on in the low end of a mix. So let's get a better metering solution for this task. You might be familiar with the spectrum of an EQ, which measures frequency energy from that human hearing range we've been talking about 20 to 20,000 Hertz. It's basically another way to view energy spread like we saw in our musical frequency chart. This kind of metering, can tell us way more about the health of our low end than the phase or level meter. But what this meter won't tell us is whether or not the low end is working for the genre you're producing music in, because different genres have different tolerances for low end. This is why we invented at Isotope tonal balance control. Now we've made loads of videos on tonal balance control, but in short, it displays the health of your track's frequency balance across four key areas from lows to highs. And it's an effective way to see your low end, literally see it when your environment might be working against you acoustically. You'll see both fine and broad views with our zero to 250 Hertz low end, we've been talking about this whole time, represented in its own quadrant right here. And if you play your track with tonal balance parked on the master bus, this white line is gonna show your mix while the bluish green blob shows the typical range of energy in each frequency band. Now here's where isotope tonal balance control is especially helpful. By flipping through the genre targets, you can see how your low end lines up across different genres because different genres have different allowances for all kinds of content, but certainly for low end. And just so you know, these targets were informed by analyzing thousands of amazing sounding songs on the streaming services today. And you can actually upload your own and have tonal balance create custom curves or whole folders of songs as well. So how can we affect low end frequency content and keep within the bounds of one of these genre targets? 
you can actually remote control level and frequency from the drop down menu here without having to have a bunch of plugin windows floating around. If your bass or kick drum feel too loud and they're contributing to some spikes in that range, you can just call up Ozone or Neutron and balance until you get a solution that you like. Now, we're going to look at this more in a moment, but it's also worth pointing out that Isotope makes Audio Lens. This is an app that listens to your computer audio, including a streaming service, playing your favorite reference track. It's going to capture the tone, level, width, and dynamics, creating a profile, a custom genre target, if you will. And you can use that target to inform Ozone's Master Assistant or Neutron's Track Assistant. But first, let's tackle the much larger issue of balance. In a mix, separation and definition largely depend on the work done in this busy low-end region that we've been obsessing over in this video. It's usually cluttered with non-essential content. It's also where the fundamental frequency or lowest note of many instruments tend to live, after which the overtones or timbre of the instrument follow. This fundamental is really, really important. Now, when I said non-essential content earlier, what do I mean? Well, let's head back to our musical frequency chart. If we were to give dedicated frequency ranges to the typical instrumentation found in many modern mixes, that might look something like this. Now, let's adjust the ranges to reveal the actual frequency content of all those instruments. Not so clear and tidy anymore, is it? We now see a mix scenario where common instruments like bass, kick, snare, piano, guitars, pads, vocals, have frequency content extending into that sacred 0 to 250 hertz range. Now as a mixer, it's your job to bring tonal balance to your mix. And to be successful, you need to determine what's meant to be down there and what's not. So let's start by doing the work. We're going to clear away things that are interfering with what really truly belongs in the low end. Having trouble guessing what's meant to be in that range? Well, remember this chart. Bass and kick typically own this area, and how much or how little can be genre dependent. Many tracks in modern mixes have low and low mid energy that when taken away, don't affect the identity of the original signal. And by removing this energy with a high pass filter, we're decluttering the low end overall. And if you're wondering how much to cut with a high pass filter, take a look at some of the presets included in Neutron. Most have a gentle slope cutting low end already, so you can use this as a starting point to trim further from there. Try bringing up the filter until the body of the track feels too thin, and then pull it back to where the most important tone of the track still remains. Anything below that range would be needlessly contributing to your low end. Use your ears and trust yourself. So let's investigate this in a mix that I have here that's kind of country pop. Take a look. Using Neutron's EQ Spectrum, I'm going to look and listen, and then high pass, allowing the highs to pass, effectively cutting the lows from sources that I think are needlessly obscuring the low end. This is hopefully going to bring our 0 to 250 hertz zone into focus in tonal balance control. And I'll use some gentle filters to accomplish this work. Now, all this subtractive EQ work can be a bit scary and feel strange, right? After all, we want to add energy to our mix. Think about a friend who just had a haircut. It could be shocking, but if you give it a day or two, you'll start to maybe notice more definition in their facial features. That's kind of what I'm talking about when I say cut stuff out, subtract, clear away to add definition. By giving haircuts to your tracks and removing information, you're actually revealing what's most important and keeping things under control. I've identified the following sources as needlessly contributing to my low end in this song. The percussion loop, some of the stomps, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and the synth. And even the bass felt a bit subby, so I rolled off some of that subsonic information with gentle filter slopes. In fact, I use gentle filter slopes all across my high passing work. So here's the mix before.
Isotope Tonal Balance Control tells us that we're in the bounds for healthy low end given our country target, which is where I think this track kind of lands sonically. Now you'll notice I didn't turn the bass down or turn the kick down or turn any other instruments down. I just cleared things away. So sometimes volume isn't the answer. Sometimes it's just frequency pruning. So clearing away unnecessary low end contributors from that zero to 250 hertz range really made a difference in terms of firming up the overall low end of the track and adding clarity. To my ears, the vocals are a bit more intelligible. The energy is clearer. The track just sounds cleaner overall. That's an example of how to find balance and create definition. I wanna speak about definition a bit more, and by definition I mean how distinct and recognizable the sounds are from one another. Balancing your instruments and scooping out low-end information from non-bass instruments will achieve more definition, but how can we take it even further? For example, now that my kick and bass are predominantly occupying the low end, how can they be more focused and articulate? Well, for starters, they're likely masking one another, which happens when one sound overlaps another, causing one to be less audible. Isotope Neutron allows us to deploy our unmasking technology, which identifies overlapping frequencies and clears them up immediately and automatically. Let's see how this works. I figured we'd take a detour into Jazz Town for the next example. You'll see three sound sources here. We have a bass, a drum loop, and some sax. Now individually, these instruments are really strong, especially the kick in this drum loop. But you'll see that when it's combined with the jazz bass, the kick just has a hard time being heard. So in order to tackle this low end challenge, what I'm going to do is place an instance of Neutron Unmask here, and then I'll also click and drag it using Option, click and drag to the other track as well. I'm gonna solo these guys so that I can do my work. So right now, the bass is kind of walking all over the kick. So what I'll do is go to my jazz bass track, and I'll select the sidechain input to be my drum loop. Now we're not gonna see anything yet, but I just wanna call your attention to the metering. The purple is my kick. The rest over here is the drum loop. So the kick's fundamental is right here. And the white trace is my jazz bass. So let's get to work untangling one from the other. And what I'll do is bring the unmasking in. So that sounds okay, but what I wanna do is localize the unmasking just to that area where I see the kicks fundamental in purple poking up and down. So I'm gonna bring these bands in to prevent unmasking from affecting anything above 142 hertz. And I'll tighten this up as well. bring this up a little bit. I'm going to bring the release and attack all the way down. I want nice quick work. Sensitivity can come up just to make sure we're safe and just catching the sidechain source. And that sounds super modern. It sounds like the kick's coming through, but I want to split the difference a bit and just bring the mix down a little bit. So now what I've done is I've unmasked the bass from the kick, or the kick from the bass. Kick sounds much more present. And let's see what that sounds like in the actual mix. So listen to how the bass is still present and articulate, especially in the low mids and upper mids, but in that zero to 250 hertz range, the kick is poking through and can be heard. 
And this is the work that goes into untangling low end with unmasking techniques in a way that I think really improves the intelligibility of certain elements in the low end. Now, there's a few other ways to bring more focus and definition to low end instruments. More often than not, that zero to 250 hertz range can't be made any louder without tilting the mix into a tubby, soupy mess. So consider using tools that excite the upper harmonics of low end instruments, effectively extending their fundamentals into a more audible range, allowing the listener to locate and source low end instruments with ease, especially on playback systems with really bad low frequency response like laptops or smartphones. Of course, we have a few tools to help with this, like low end focus in Ozone 10. Listen to the added pop and snap we can add to the kick with some spectral contrast. Take a listen to how that 808 perks up and almost comes out from under a blanket. Now my last tip for controlling low end is gonna be about the mastering stage, specifically in compression. We've already produced six seasons of our NAM Tech Award nominated Are You Listening series, which I very much encourage you to watch in full, but there's one tip in particular worth repeating here. Low frequency energy contained in a full stereo track is by far the most transient, lots of energy. Bass drum, bass guitar, the bottom of a snare, they can be really dynamic, meaning these instruments will often trigger a mastering compressor more often and faster than other melodic instruments with more constant level, like vocals or hi-hats. If the mastering compressor's threshold is pulled down, dynamic and transient elements of a mix will cause the compressor to get to work more quickly, which could cause a kind of pumping effect which may not be desirable. If, to you, that's undesirable, head to the sidechain detection area here and use the built-in high-pass filter to effectively stop low-frequency information from triggering the compressor. By performing this move, I'm not allowing the compressor to hear the kick, bass, or even the bottom of that snare. Let's do a before and after and listen to how that low end is retained in the after and how it almost brings the whole mix down in the before. So there, that pumping caused by that very dynamic low end energy of the mix is effectively gone, allowing more of the low end to come back in naturally. It's up to you to decide if you like the pumping or not. Heck, it's up to you to decide if you liked the high passing I was doing earlier to get the tonal balance kind of quadrant under control. My goal is just to give you tools and strategies to navigate low end challenges in your mix. Thank you so much for watching this video. We've reached the end and we couldn't cover every technique or concept related to low end management, but I hope that the folks who did stick around and made it to the end are gonna leave a comment with their own techniques and strategies. And hopefully you folks now have knowledge and tools to perceive and then tackle low end. Take care.